Top 5 Most Painful Deaths of All Time Number 1. Deadpool Abigail Taylor was just 6 years old when Hennepin County Medical Center received a dispatch call for a young girl injured at the Minneapolis Golf Club Community Pool on June 29, 2007. The emergency services workers never imagined the horrific injury they would discover upon arrival. According to Scott Taylor, Abby's father, his daughter just got out of the kiddie pool after sustaining an unknown injury. She began losing balance when walking over to her parents and fell face first onto the community pool deck. The family initially thought she was suffering from a seizure, but upon further assessment, emergency medical technicians found a two-inch deep laceration on Abby's rectum. Unbeknownst to them, Abigail's lower intestine had been sucked out of the two-inch gash by an uncovered suction drain in the the golf club kiddie pool. Abby's father said a search in the kiddie pool filter turned up several feet of Abigail's small intestine. Hennepin County Medical Center paramedics treated and transported Abigail to a children's hospital in Minneapolis where she remained in serious condition and faced a series of invasive surgeries. Doctors remove what was left of Abby's small intestine and her father says his daughter will have to be fed intravenously for the rest of her life, with the majority of her nutrients being received via IV fluids. She will also have to use a colostomy bag whenever she needs to use the restroom. The doctors told Abby's parents there was no medical reason why she should have even survived the traumatic accident. Unfortunately, the road to recovery for Abby was tumultuous with very little sign of progressive hope. Eventually, she would need various transplants, but in the meantime, she got to go home for the remainder of her recovery. According to the Consumer Product Safety Commission, pressure on some pool drains can be as strong as 300 pounds per every square inch, and this kind of pressure can suck in hair, body parts, or trap swimmers underwater and cause them to drown. At least three other children have suffered similar injuries in community pools since 1990, and 33 others have died in drain related accidents. These previous tragedies prompted efforts to enact new pool safety laws, but all proposals failed until Abby's story was publicized. Congress enacted the new pool laws in mid-December 2007, the same day that Abigail underwent transplant surgery. The new federal pool safety law drafted as a result of the incident banned the manufacturing, selling, and distribution of drain covers that don't meet anti-entrapment safety standards. It also required the use of less powerful drainage systems to all existing and new public swimming pools. That same month, Abby received a new small bowel, liver, and pancreas, but she later suffered multiple setbacks that would fatally destabilize her condition. In the beginning of 2008, Scott Taylor said Abby needed kidney dialysis to remove excess fluid built up throughout her body. A few months after the transplant and dialysis, Abby's condition continued to rapidly deteriorate. She developed a cancerous condition that was triggered by her newly transplanted organs. The condition, called PTLD or post-transplant lipoproliferative disease, directly affects healthy blood cells in the body. In addition to all the other complications she was already facing, the doctors had to start Abby on chemotherapy. In early March 2008, her new organs were beginning to severely fail. Devastatingly, her body also simultaneously began rejecting her new liver. By that time, Abby had had countless infections and more than 16 surgical procedures since the day of her accident. And on March 20th, 2008, at 6.10pm, Abigail succumbed to her complications and passed away peacefully with her family by her side. Number 2. I'll Stop the World and Melt With You Despite what superhero movies may have told you, exposure to radiation is much more likely to result in a long, agonizing death than in developing superpowers. The actual reaction that produces the exposure symptoms is the ability of radiation ions to rip apart atoms and molecules, making cells highly unstable and reactive. In other words, cells can't communicate to one another and are incapable of doing their job. Understandably, this is a disastrous situation for the human body's anatomical functions. The severity of your symptoms depends on the dose and the type of radiation exposure you endure. Small doses of exposure will bring about nausea, headaches, vomiting, fevers, and rashes, and slightly higher doses will start to rip apart your cells, causing both red and white blood cells to die. This translates to a weakened immune system as your white blood cells, red blood cells, and platelet counts start to drop. At extreme doses, the skin becomes red, blistered, and begins to slough off. The headaches and vomiting become debilitatively intense, and treatments such as blood and bone marrow transfusions render ineffective. And this was exactly the case for Hisashi Aochi and his unfortunate radiation exposure. His fatal injuries and subsequent treatment remain a cautionary tale more than 20 years after the traumatic offense took place. Hisashi Aochi was employed as a plant worker at the Tokaimura nuclear power plant tasked with the incredibly dangerous duty of reprocessing uranium by a company called JCO. A report put out by the World Nuclear Association to 
determined that the company had dismissed mandatory regulation policies, enacted unsafe transfer practices, and encouraged uses of outdated equipment for their employees. In addition to these hazardous conditions, the workers had minimal to no training for many of the operational tasks performed. On September 30th, 1999, Azochi was pouring a potent solution of uranyl nitrate into a containment tank. The tank was not equipped to handle the amount of radioactive material being dispensed into it. When the tank reached critical mass levels and a nuclear fission chain reaction occurred, the lone survivor of the event, Yutaka Yokokawa, cooperated with what Ochi later told investigators. They both witnessed a loud banging noise and an intense blue flash as immense amounts of neutron beams and gamma radiation filled the entire room. The sequence of events is detailed in a report issued by the International Atomic Energy Agency following the incident. One of the colleagues was viewing the transfer from behind a desk about 15 feet away, and another stood close by Ochi, who had to extend a large portion of his body directly over the tank to perform the task. The separation accounts for the varying severity of exposure and subsequent effects upon the three men following the accident. By the time a rescue team was able to move him from the accident site, Ochi had been exposed to 17 sieverts of radiation, more than twice what is commonly considered a fatal level of exposure. To this day, Hisashi Ochi was exposed to the highest amount of radiation any human has ever been exposed to in documented history. The accident led Ochi to experience dizziness, lightheadedness, and nausea. He was seen vomiting profusely in the decontamination room before losing consciousness. And after being transported via helicopter to the National Institute of Radiological Sciences and put in a room for treatment and observation, he seemed remarkably stable for days afterwards and even joked around with the nurses about getting better and getting to go home. However, it became clear that his ailments were not temporary and his condition became irrevocably severe. The doctors did a micrograph of his bone marrow and discovered that the chromosomes were destroyed and his white blood cell count was severely depleted. So the doctors administered many methods of treatment, including an early experimental test of stem cell therapy using his sister's stem cells. The machines keeping Ochi alive grew increasingly drastic as his condition deteriorated. The radiation poisoning massively damaged his chromosomes, which in turn wrecked havoc on his internal organs. Most of Ochi's organs began to fail and he experienced a complete loss of bowel control. Three weeks later, his intestines began hemorrhaging and he was given as many as 10 blood transfusions over the course of just 12 hours. His skin would blister and began to fall off in front of the doctors and his bodily wounds were endlessly sleeping blood and fluids. His wife recalls Ochi bleeding out of his eyes like he was crying blood. And in order to try to eradicate the loss of fluids through his skin, doctors administered various skin transplants. But unfortunately, the skin grafts would no longer adhere to Ochi's body and continuously sloughed off. A nurse's written record of Ochi being in immense pain says Ochi could be heard crying out, No more, I'm going home, please stop. He was put into a medically induced coma for a short time when his symptoms became too painful to manage while awake. Just two months after the accident, Ochi's body continuously hemorrhages, his heart works overtime to pump enough blood throughout his body and averages about 100 120 beats per minute while completely bedridden. Here is a chronological outline of Ochi's physical symptoms and his rapid deterioration as a result of his radiation exposure. On day 6, 90% of his white blood cells die. A transplant is conducted and the progression is so aggressive he loses 20 liters of body fluid every single day. Day number 8, pulling his clothes off would take off pieces of skin. Day number 11, he experienced lung failure. Day 14, the whole outer layer of skin is deteriorated. Pain becomes so severe he can't sleep for days on end without even feeling pain in his sleep. Day 7, 17, white blood cell transplants starting to show damaging effects and there's inability to fight off infection. Day 24, his body itself starts emitting radiation. Day 27, white cell failure continues and confirmed. Day 30, after many skin transplants are done, including his own thigh skin, all of them have failed and are rejected. His facial features are now completely unrecognizable and skin casually slides off the bone. Blood and fluids are continuously oozing out throughout the course of the day. Day 48, there's continuous bleeding in the intestines. Day 59, after three heart failures and three revivals are performed, all his ribs are broken, but nothing can be done to treat his broken bones as his bone marrow count is so low. The treatment will render ineffective. Day 65, his immune system is disfigured and there is no immunity left in the body. Self-immune attacks start to take place and there's more white cell failure. On day 83, all the membranes in the intestines have perished, all his muscles are atrophied, organs have failed, and no other procedure could be done. So on November 27, 1999, Oshi's heart stopped after being resuscitated three times despite begging for his suffering to end. Nonetheless, the doctor's measures kept getting more intricate and complicated as their interest in studying Oshi's condition only increased as Oshi's suffering simultaneously continued. The justification for keeping Oshi alive for such an extended period was the subject of heated debate following his eventual death. Scientists and medical professionals claimed that the data they collected from his case would be useful in the event of future radiation-based injuries. His family members also held 
held out hope for a long time following the accident that Oshi would miraculously recover from his injuries. Nearing the end, Ochi was literally begging the doctors to allow him to die, reportedly telling them that he wasn't a guinea pig. Thankfully, a do not resuscitate order was put into effect, and when Ochi suffered another severe cardiac arrest, his vitals began shutting down. After an agonizing 83 days of hell, doctors finally allowed Ochi to pass away. One of Ochi's last documented words by his nurses are, Mommy, please. The co-workers who stood closest to Ochi, Masato Shinohara, suffered even longer than Ochi. It took him five agony-filled months before he passed away. Doctors had hopes for him at first and gave him many skin transplants. The transplants would work temporarily, but nothing lasted. Half of his body became bruised and began rotting away. Both of them were fully conscious during the whole thing, and reportedly they felt every single painful complication and the slow, agonizing deterioration of their physical bodies. Number three, love will tear us apart. Timothy Treadwell was an eccentric documentary filmmaker and a quirky naturalist who lived among the coastal grizzly bears in Alaska's isolated Katmai National Park. He lived in these conditions for 13 seasons to promote understanding and protection of wildlife and grizzly bears. On October 5, 2003, during his 13th visit, Treadwell and his girlfriend were killed and eaten by either one or two grizzly bears who aggressively came across their path. According to Treadwell's journals, his girlfriend feared the grizzlies and felt increasingly uncomfortable in their presence. Treadwell chose to set his campsite near a salmon stream where grizzlies commonly feed in autumn. Treadwell was in Cat May later in the year than usual, at a time where bears attempt to gain as much fat as possible before winter hibernation. Food was scarce that fall, causing the grizzly bears to be more aggressive than usual, and Treadwell was to leave the park at his usual time of the year, but extended to stay a week in an effort to locate a favorite female bear of his. He said he hated modern civilization and felt better in nature surrounding with bears than he did in big cities surrounded with humans, and the bears he had previously interacted with that season had already gone into hibernation, and other bears from the park were moving into the area that he set up camp. Some of the last footage taken by Treadwell hours before his death includes a video of a bear aggressively diving into the river repeatedly for a piece of dead salmon. Treadwell cryptically mentions in the footage that he did not feel comfortable around that particular bear. The next day on October 6, 2003, an air taxi pilot arrived at Treadwell's campsite to pick him and his girlfriend up, but found the area abandoned. Concerned, he immediately contacted the local park rangers. The couple's mangled remains were discovered quickly upon investigation. Treadwell's disfigured head, partial spine, and right forearm and hand were recovered a short distance from the campsite. His girlfriend's partial remains were found next to the torn and collapsed tents, partially buried in a mound of twigs and dirt. A large male grizzly protecting the campsite was killed by park rangers during their attempt to retrieve the bodies. A second adolescent bear was also killed a short time later when it charged the park rangers. An on-site necropsy of the first bear killed revealed human body parts such as fingers and limbs. The younger bear was consumed by other animals before it could be necropsied. A video camera was recovered at the site that had been operated during the time of the attack, but police said that the six-minute tape contained only voices and cries as the brown bear mauled Treadwell to death. The fact that the tape contained only sound led troopers to believe the attack might have happened while the camera was stuffed in a duffel bag. The camera had been turned on just before the attack, presumably by sound activation, but the camera recorded only six minutes of audio before running out of tape. That was just enough time to record the incident on Treadwell and his agonizing screams. Number four, 14 and electrocuted. In the face of a shortage of lethal injection drugs, the U.S. thought about bringing back the electric chair as a means of capital punishment. Even if all goes swiftly, there is no getting around the fact that the victim is essentially cooked alive in one of the most brutal methods of execution. As the electric current zaps through the person's body, the heart stops, blood boils, bodies will swell up and boiling hot blood will pour out of every orifice, the eyes, ears, nose, etc. Body temperature can become so hot that the flesh sometimes cooks apart from the victim's bones and slides off, and their nervous system jams causing asphyxiation and sometimes the eyeballs pop out of their socket and flames burst from underneath bubbling skin. If you're unlucky, then the voltage might not be high enough to kill you, at least not quickly enough. There have been instances where the process has taken up to 10 minutes, and as the current renders the victim unable to control movement or speech, they will have to silently cook alive while still remaining cognitively conscious. George Stinney Jr. is one of those unfortunate souls who endured being electrocuted alive for a crime he didn't even commit. George lived in the segregated town of Alcalu, South Carolina, where white and people of color were separated by railroad tracks. Stinney's family were forced to leave their town when George was wrongfully accused of killing two neighborhood white girls. In March 1940, 44, Betty June Binnaker, 11, and Mary Emma Thames, 7, 
riding their bicycles in Alkalu looking for flowers. When they saw Stinny and his younger sister aim during their journey, they stopped and asked if they knew where to find Maypops, the edible fruit of passion flowers. Binnaker and Thames never made it home that day, and that was reportedly the last time the girls were seen alive. Their disappearance prompted hundreds of Alkalu residents, including Stinny's father, to come together and search for the missing girls. It wasn't until the next day when their dead bodies were discovered in a ditch with their skulls bashed in. When Dr. Asbury Cecil Bozard examined their bodies, there was no clear sign of struggle, but both girls had met violent deaths involving multiple head injuries. Thames had a hole straight through her forehead protruding into her skull, along with a two-inch long cut above her right eyebrow. Meanwhile, Binnaker had suffered at least seven blows to the head. Dr. Bozard concluded that Binnaker and Thames had wounds that were very likely caused by a round instrument about the size of the head of a hammer. A rumor began floating around the town that the girls had made another stop at a very prominent white family's home on the same day that they were murdered, but nothing was confirmed. When Clarendon County Law Enforcement enforcement officers learned from a witness that Binnaker and Thames were seen talking to Stinney, they went to Stinney's home. George Stinney Jr. was promptly handcuffed interrogated for hours in a small room without his parents, an attorney, or any witnesses present. Police claimed that Stinney confessed to murdering Binnaker and Thames after his plan to have sex with one of the girls failed. An officer named H.S. Newman wrote in a handwritten statement, I arrested a boy by the name of George Stinney. He then made a confession and told me where to find a piece of iron about 15 inches long. He said he put it in a ditch about six feet from the bicycle and Newman refused to reveal where Stinney was detained. Not even Stinney's parents knew where their son was as his trial quickly approached. At the time, 14 was considered the age of responsibility, and Stinney was believed to be responsible for this murder. About a month after the girls' deaths, George Stinney Jr.'s trial began at a Clarendon County courthouse. Court-appointed attorney Charles Plowden did little to nothing to defend his client. During the two-hour trial, Plowden failed to call witnesses to the stand or present any evidence that would cast reasonable doubt on the prosecution's case. The most significant piece of evidence presented against Stinney was his alleged confession, but there was no written record of the teen admitting to the murders. By the time of his trial, Stinney hadn't seen his parents in weeks, and they were too afraid of getting attacked by mobs of angry neighbors to come to the courthouse to see their son. The 14-year-old was surrounded by 1,500 strangers during his trial and questioning. Following a deliberation that took less than 10 minutes, the all-white jury found Stinney guilty of murder with no recommendation for mercy. On April 24, 1944, the teen was sentenced to death by electrocution, and on June 16, 1944, George Stinney Jr. walked into the execution chamber at the South Carolina State Penitentiary in Columbia with a Bible tucked under his arm. Weighing in at just about 95 pounds, he was dressed in a loose-fitting striped jumpsuit and strapped into an adult-sized electric chair. He was so small that the state electrician struggled to adjust an electrode on his right leg. A mask that was too big for him was placed over his face, and an assistant captain asked Stinney if he had any last words. Stinney replied with no sir, and the prison doctor prodded, you don't want to say anything about what you did. Again, Stinney replied, no sir. When officials turned up the switch, 2,400 volts surged through Stinney's body, causing the mask to slip off. His eyes were wide and teary, and saliva was projecting from his mouth for all the witnesses in the room to see. After two more jolts of electricity, it was over. Stinney was pronounced dead shortly after, and in just a span of 83 days, the boy had been charged with murder, tried, convicted, and executed by the state. It took a jury of white men 10 minutes to find Stinney guilty, but it would take over 70 years before Stinney was exonerated for a crime he did not commit. His siblings claimed that his confession was coerced and that he had an alibi. At the time of the murders, he was with his sister Aim watching the family's cow. After months of consideration, on December 17, 2014, Judge Carmen T. Mullen vacated Stinney's murder conviction, calling the death sentence a great and fundamental injustice. George Stinney Jr.'s siblings were overjoyed to learn that their brother was exonerated after 70 years of injustice. Number 5. The Third Shot's The Charm on February 28, a 39-year-old unidentified John Doe committed suicide in Canberra, Australia by shooting himself three times with a pump-action shotgun. The first shot passed through his chest but missed all vital organs. He reloaded and shot away his throat and part of his jaw, and breathing through what was left of his mutilated throat, he reloaded again. Only this time, he held the gunshot barrel against his chest with his hands but operated the trigger with his toes. This shot entered the thoracic cavity and demolished his heart and killed him instantly. During the investigation, the possibility of murder was considered, but reconstruction of the case and post-mortem findings led to a corneal conclusion that the death was a suicide, accounted for by the type of weapon used and the stamina of the deceased. Remarkably, the suicide victim walked about 15 meters from the site after inflicting the first, relatively superficial but extremely painful shot to his chest. After the second attempt, he shot out his larynx and presumably dropped the gun, ejecting a second spent cartridge and one of the remaining shells on the ground. Then, he moved about 136 meters 
over to make his final attempt by using his toes and shooting out his heart with his last cartridge. A Winchester pump-action shotgun was lying about a meter from his body with the barrel facing up. And shotguns of this type are now banned in all of Australia, as they are far from ideal as a suicide weapon or any weapon for that matter, largely because of the length of the barrel and partly because of the significant recoil, making it very difficult to gauge the direction of the shot. To put the experience into real-life perspective, I found an article of an attempted suicide survivor and a subsequent head gunshot survivor who described their symptoms in detail. At first, both parties report feeling the sensation of being mentally transported somewhere else, almost a dissociative sensation that allows the gunshot victim to begin to process the injury. And after the initial shock, people will begin to experience the sensation of warm blood starting to pour out of the gunshot wound. They say it feels like thick, hot, but metallic molasses that begins to cover every orifice in your body, making it difficult to breathe, see, smell, or taste. And if the victim is still conscious to experience the pain of the shot, the victim will describe a burning sensation radiating all over from the gunshot site. The agonizing pain is similar to that of a broken bone being torn inside out, and if you survive the turmoil and are able to make it to the emergency room, the running blood will begin to dry over your esophagus and nose, making breathing even more challenging. Once you are admitted and hooked up to oxygen, the coagulated and dried blood will make the administering of IVs and other necessary tubing almost unbearably painful, making this failed suicide attempt and subsequent treatments one of the most painful ways of death in documented existence. So that's it for today's video, guys. If you enjoyed today's countdown, let me know down in the comments if you would like to see a part two to this video. And if you're enjoying this particular series, make sure you give the video a thumbs up so it reaches other people in the recommended queue. And I'll see you guys in the next one.